All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Store Trends Virtual Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Tyler Newberry, and we'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. Um, we'll let everyone get settled, and uh, everyone can kind of get on the webinar. If you did order a pizza, it should be arriving within the next few minutes or so. Um, so just sit back. If the delivery person is taking a little bit longer, um, please be patient with them, and uh, we'll be getting started in just a few moments. Thanks so much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Store Trends Virtual Lunch and Learn. Um, so great to finally be with everybody today and uh, have this opportunity to present to you. Um, we're very excited to um, present to you a little bit of information on the benefits of hybrid or all flash storage uh, in the industry today. Uh, my name is Tyler Newberry. Um, I'm on the marketing team here at uh, Store Trends. Uh, with me today, we've got our senior solutions engineer, Mr. James Dykowski with us. Um, I'll be your moderator. James will be coming along in just a couple of moments here. We do have just a couple of quick housekeeping items to take care of um, before we actually get started. Um, first of all, the pizza. Um, your pizza order should be arriving within the next few minutes or so. Um, if your pizza is not arriving in the next few minutes or so, please reach out to me via email. My email can be found beneath the um, actual video here on the uh, description of the video. It's Tyler in at AMI.com and you can see it up here on the presenter slide. Um, that would be much quicker than you actually posting to the YouTube event um, because we don't get to check that as often because since we're doing the presentation. So it'd be much quicker if you shot me an email, let me know your pizza's running late. Um, if it's not there within the next 10 minutes or so, like I said, please go ahead and shoot me that email over. Um, other than that, we will be getting started um, in just a moment here. Um, another, couple of, another couple of things, feel free to post any questions that you have um, regarding the event to the uh, to the actual message board below there. We'll try to get to all of those if we can. If we cannot for some reason, we'll shoot you an email afterwards. And uh, please remember that there are no dumb questions here. Um, we try to keep these as much to be uh, technology questions as possible, but um, just had actually had a question come in for, uh, can I get a little addition to my pizza? Um, so uh, we'll take we'll take all questions. We're not uh, we're not snobs in that sense at all. Um, other than that, though, um, you'll see a couple of links down there in the description as well. Feel free to fill those out as we go along, but we'll explain those in a little bit greater detail uh, as we go along. Um, other than that, um, looks like we are just about ready to get started. It's a beautiful day in Atlanta, Georgia. Hope you're somewhere nice as well. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our senior solutions engineer, Mr. James Dykowski, and um, he'll get the presentation started for us just momentarily. All right. Thanks a bunch, Tyler. Um, so what we'll do is um, just kind of run through everything. Uh, again, there are no such thing as a dumb question. So really, um, you know, reach out and quite honestly, if it if it pertains and, and Tyler's not busy with a bunch of questions or anything, uh, usually we can even answer them while we go through the presentation. So um, so that is excellent. And let me slide over here. Um, so yeah, so who is AMI? Uh, one thing we like to start with is, um, you know, just where we've come from in our history, uh, corporation wise. Uh, and you can see here, you know, we have a lot of um, offices around the world. Uh, we were founded 30 years ago, uh, and we have a worldwide presence um, just about everywhere. Uh, we have about 1300 employees. This is continually growing. Uh, it's hard to even keep that that number in check. Um, and at some point, somehow, what have you, we're in about 60% of the computers worldwide. Um, this is with the products you can see on the top right with the AMI BIOS, um, Aptio. These are just the, the BIOS chipsets that 
uh, we've been continually growing with um, throughout the years, and that's absolutely not going anywhere. Um, and then the remote access controllers, things like um, the Dell iDRAC card, uh, all that is OEM'd out by us to Dell and, and whatnots. Um, so again, just another way that, you know, we're probably in one of your computers some, somewhere. Um, and then one thing to note is the LSI, um, uh, now Avago, who uh, purchased them last year, um, logo on the top right. And uh, one thing in this, so we did own the Mega Raid controller um, years ago, you know, over, over 10 years ago now. Um, and we sold that off. And one thing we did was actually bring that team back to develop the Store Trends product line. So we do have a lot of innovative um, personnel behind this product. And we're not, we're building this from the ground up. This has uh, been a project over 10 years um, that we're coming out into the market with. Uh, we have a lot of patents, 114 granted patents, over 160 pending patents uh, on this technology. Uh, that in perspective, uh, you know, some of our other competitors, they might have five patents and I'm being generous. So a lot of homegrown technology here. And, you know, we always focus on just trying to make everything more efficient and actually something to where we can make the product in uh, get into everybody's hands and stuff like that. Uh, that's where our company has always been and always going to be. Uh, we have a lot of installs for store trends. You can see over 1300 in the last year, um, basically focusing on our all flash and our hybrid solutions, uh, which the all flash um, we've been shipping as, as, a, as one piece uh, to where now we've actually made that more efficient with this latest release. So uh, we'll talk about all this stuff now. And again, reach out with any questions that you have um, uh, regarding technology or what have you. Hey, James, just let me pop in there real quick. Um, great start, by the way. Loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we are using YouTube, which is a, um, you know, got to remember it's a free service, but it's one of those that's um, usually very accessible to everyone, which is why we use YouTube. Um, the thing about YouTube is occasionally it'll kind of go in and out with quality. Um, it's very rare that it actually does this, but um, just about once every event, you know, we will get a little bur blurry for a second or we may lose audio or get a little grainy, you know, every 30 minutes to an hour or so. Um, if this uh, becomes prolonged for you, we recommend just trying to refresh the page real quick um, and seeing if that um, if that helps. Um, again, yeah, we do apologize if it happens for a prolonged time, but just want to make you guys aware. Um, so if anything does pop up, you guys can um, at least, you know, have some tools to try to fix it real quick. All right. There you go, James. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, there is nothing more frustrating than that. So uh, he is our YouTube guru here. So, um, so we'll kind of jump on in and, um, uh, get into, you know, all flash and hybrids and just talk about SSDs and technology and, you know, where does this fit? Where does this not fit? Um, right here, you can see we have two environments. We have the spinning disk environment. It's very legacy environment, five um, shelves. You know, you get about 40 terabytes worth of usable capacity. Um, you know, when we look at latency, this is the response time of IO to your actual application. Uh, so it's a huge focus. And this is really where we drive the conversations now. Uh, with all flash arrays. Um, IOPS, you can see you get about 13,000 IOPS. Um, in this case, you know, uh, it just depends on what we're looking at for reads, writes, and then disk types also play into factors, uh, as well as RAID sets. Um, for rack space, obviously there's a lot of rack space. With rack space in each in individual shelf, you're looking at more power. There's dual power supplies for each one of these guys. Um, you know, CO2 emissions, all this stuff kind of piles up. Um, especially with heat that draws off of these spinning drives. I mean, you just you have so much more involved in this solution. Um, pretty expensive as well to have multiple enclosures and stuff. You know, you're looking at over $100,000 for the solution. If you do your dollar per gig to really find the value in it, we're looking at $3 a gig. Um, now, all of this is just based on just normal information, right? Uh, so now if we look at what the future holds, and this is really where everybody's going, uh, we've had a tremendous response for uh, even our hybrid and our all flash arrays, what we're showing here. Um, so the 3600, this is the store trends latest release. This is an all flash array. You're looking at, you know, 12 terabytes, almost 13 terabytes worth of raw capacity. Now at a 3.5 to one ratio, and this is a lower end ratio. You're looking at a usable capacity of 40 terabytes. Now you can see how this compares to what your usable is on the spinning disk environment. Now the big difference is the latency. Your response time is 10 times faster. Uh, your IOPS, your max IOPS, which 
it's kind of subjective of what you need IAPS wise. Really, you just want to have the IO responded to as fast as possible. Uh, but you know, you're looking at upwards of 100,000 IAPS, actually even more. And this is just a, a standard number here. And then you can see the rack space a lot less. With that, a lot less power, a lot less CO2 emissions, and even better, it's less heat. All that stuff. Spinning drives are just naturally hotter. Um, so you can see just a more simpler solution all around. And at half the cost, $1.24 a gig for usable capacity, it's a great solution. Um, so now if we compare this, some, some guys are, you know, hey, you know, we're looking at server side cash instead of, you know, this and that. And it's a different angle to look at. Um, so what we'll say is uh, because it's a different technology, you know, we are focusing on four terabytes worth of raw capacity here. Of course, you know, rack space, power, emission, it's, it's minimal if you look at it as an overhead. Um, but what we're really looking at here is latency. So if you have online analytical processing, just a heavy read environment, you're looking at 400 microseconds for your response time. Very great. This is where this fits in very well. And that is assuming that, you know, the cache is filled with whatever data that it's already been responded to and already come out of the, the underlying disk. Um, but the problem is, say you have a heavy transaction processing environment, the OLTP, you know, there's a lot of writes and you're looking at a lot of latency because it's just not designed to do this to where it actually has to commit these rights to another location, uh, to another server or something like that. And that's where your latency just goes through the roof. Um, and, you know, even for any of the rights, this is what your, you know, expected response time is going to be. So if you start averaging these things out, the 50-50, the 6733 mix, you can kind of see where that average ends up being to where in this sub one millisecond environment, looking at, you know, say you have, um, um, writes at three milliseconds or just a heavy write environment or something like that, your average is one and a half, two milliseconds, worst case scenario on a heavy write environment for the all flash array. So you can kind of see where that um, kind of compares and stuff like that. Um, and then you have a lot of CapEx here. Um, you know, in general, if you have a minimum of three servers, you have to buy the disk and stuff like that. You're looking at 20 to $25,000. Now you can look at actually, well, okay, what is my value here? What's our dollar per gig? What are we paying for overall? You know, and you just, you get a lot more value with an all flash array. Um, and in general, I mean, $6 a gig, you know, even, even some of the more expensive flash arrays you can fit in for that. So value wise, it's a huge note. So now we talk about the hybrid. So now let's compare the two. Okay, so now we have 40 terabytes on the left, uh, 45 terabytes is kind of the way that this particular unit uh, worked out. Your latency, of course, you're looking at sub three milliseconds versus 10 milliseconds here. And now your IOPS, your peak IOPS, because we focus this IO to the SSDs, because we're doing caching and tiering together, we can actually really um, endure a lot of flexibility throughout the day, changes that happen with your workloads and get up easily to this 100,000 IOPS level um, for your hot data effectively. And we'll kind of talk about how that how that would actually work and how in the world could we possibly say what the hot data is, right? Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but of course, same story again, a lot less rack space, power emissions. Uh, and again, you know, $44,000, a lot less cost. You're looking at 98 cents a gig. Now, why in the world would we try to confuse everybody and have a confusing message, right? So how do these two compare together? Well, one of the issues with dedupe is sometimes you don't know what it is, you don't know what you're going to get out of it. Um, so say that dedupe ratio went down, say it's a 1.8 to one ratio in your environment or whatnot. Now this drops our usable capacity down to 23 terabytes. Now we're looking at 220 a gig. Well, if you have 50 terabytes, this absolutely makes a huge difference. And that's to where the hybrid array would absolutely fit in. It does a very good job in basically maintaining what, what you have as performance and stuff like that. So this is kind of the comparable, and this is the business case between the two of, you know, I, if money wasn't a, a problem, you know what, everybody just get as many flash drives as possible. You're done and over with it. It doesn't matter. Money is a problem. We do have to make sure that we maximize what we're doing performance wise and also capacity wise, because that's where the business case comes in. Um, so now obviously the price of SSDs, these things are expensive, um, dollar per gig wise, you know, um, they can really get high. If you look at a two terabyte drive, if anybody wants to go online and look that up for, and even worse, you have to have an enterprise class drive because they can handle a lot more rights. Um, depending on the drive, you know, they can handle 10 times, 15 times over drive rights 
basically throughout the whole capacity every day for five years versus an MLC drive, you're looking at a fifth of the drive can, complete, can be completely written as subjective, can be written to four or five years. So that's 87 petabytes versus under a petabyte for five years worth of writes, basically. Obviously reads, we don't care. And these are all things that we do deal with as we, as we kind of talk through this. If you look at SN, SSD endurance, obviously they're limited on how long they'll last, um, depending on the vendor, you know, the predictability of when they're gonna uh, basically expire or run out of rights is another subjective thing. Um, and then, so now we wanna try to maximize the space. We're reducing what we're writing to disk and that's where dedupe and compression comes in. Um, the capacity expectations for dedupe, big X factor. Oh yeah, you're gonna get a seven to one because you're doing this or doing that. You know, not everybody believes in that first of all, and then even even worse, you know, say, say you just don't get that out of your workload, what have you. So that's why hybrid solutions absolutely fit in for the bad dedupe ratios. And you just have to have the space allocated for your data because everything's unique or a lot of it's unique, stuff like that. Um, and then the performance of dedupe, absolutely, there's overhead to it. If I could put six terabyte drives out there and dedupe everything to it, that would be excellent. However, there is a performance hit on this. And that's why we do have to, you know, that's where SSDs really come in. And, you know, they're a hundred times faster than the spinning disk drives. That kind of gets mitigated with the dedupe performance and stuff like that. So you can really maximize this. So what about latency? So a lot of people talk about IOPS and, and even I have to talk about IOPS. Everybody's um, been kind of geared to focus on IOPS. Um, and so at 100,000 IOPS, what does it take to get there in perspective? So obviously these blocks aren't to scale by any means, at least for the four disks to the 285 disks going up, but you can definitely get to 100,000 IOPS easily with four SSDs, um, 285 disks for 15K. Now that's, that's only reads though, mind you. And then, you know, 400 and 500 disks for the 7.2K. So there's a few things to look at here. A, the 7.2K, it spins at half the speed of the 15K. It literally gets half the IOPS as the 15K. Um, caching does play a role into that. You know, if you do have caching kind of going in between there. But in general, when you do have a read, you have to pull that out. If it's a continually cached read and stuff, that does change everything for you guys that are going to say, oh, you're wrong in the say we have to actually respond from disk in all these scenarios this is how it pulls out right so now what's the correlating latency for this so we scope these individual environments for a hundred thousand iops that's what say this customer has one millisecond will be your latency for your ssds on a hundred thousand iops at all at all reads 7.5 milliseconds will be your 15K RPM at that load. And that's a full load for 285 disks. So that's where you're going to be at. Now, say you have 150,000 IOP peaks or something like that throughout the day. Now your latency is going to go from seven and a half, uh, probably up to around 15. So you're, you're doubling or you're, ha you're going up by 150% basically. Now that scale for latency versus the IO that you're um, running with, that does not go linearly. That's all exponential or logarithmic uh, if we go downwards. So you can see 12 milliseconds for your 10K, 15 milliseconds for your 7.2K. Now, say you have, I don't know, 5,000 IOPS on this 7.2K chart right here. Now, what will happen is because it's logarithmic and it flattens out, the best or the better response times that you're going to get are really more around five, five milliseconds. So you're really never going to exceed that even though you have so many drives spun together. Now that's where SSDs come in to where these things um, at the lowest load, you have the bus that you have to go through. But other than that, you're done. You can respond to IO very, very quickly. And you're probably looking at, you know, a quarter of a millisecond, basically um, 250 microseconds, um, bef you know, of just response time if you are at say 5,000 IOPS or something like that. So you can kind of see how these correlate and how latency really impacts um, um, the response time of your IO and stuff like that. Um, so we'll kind of power through here. So latency. So we talk about these, these numbers, these values, and what do they really mean? So, you know, for iSCSI, the timeout setting is 120 seconds. Well, that's 120,000 milliseconds, right? So you have a lot of time there um, for failovers and stuff like that, that just naturally can happen in iSCSI. Um, you know, it's, it's overcoming failures and stuff like that. Now going into one second, 
we have a few different levels here. And this is, I mean, obviously, uh, hope, um, obviously, hopefully everybody's within one second where the latency in general, but you can see here this 800 milliseconds, this is kind of a black hole of, um, of latency, at least for you, uh, you VMware guys, um, to where 800 milliseconds, if you average this, sustain it, basically you will actually see VMs freeze. The VMFS will actually freeze up and start going into a read only mode for your VMs. Um, just because it's trying to protect itself from failures and it's it's good for what it does however it induces a lot of problems but you probably already have a bigger problem if you are seeing the sustained um, latency here um, so going from the top down you know five milliseconds this is a very fast response time snappy is one of my customers um, things that they've kind of they brought to me and i'll actually show it here in a little bit um, to where they were like look i need this thing to be snappy i need it to move um, and so we put in an all flash array and they did exactly that. So, um, so obviously everybody's focused on this. Most everybody, uh, if you don't already have flash arrays in, installed and stuff like that, you're in this blue range right here, this five to 20 milliseconds. It's okay. You know, it runs, you know, you run a report, maybe it's a little slower, what have you, but in general, you're, you're fluid. Every, everything's good. Um, at that little 15 millisecond line, you will start seeing, you know, SQL yell at you saying, hey, 15 milliseconds of latency, you know, and in general, it's going to be once a week or once a month that you're going to hit that uh, if you have a fully um, vetted solution, basically storage wise. Um, and then you get in this 20, 50 milliseconds. Um, there's probably rarities to where, you know, if you are running that report and you do say, oh, you know what, this thing's actually going kind of slow, you're going to hit that as a peak. But other than that, you're fine. And then over 50 milliseconds, you know, this is it's dog slow. You know, you just you want this thing to be fast. You want it to be snappy um, and all that stuff. And um, that's basically why we're here. Right. So this is where these kind of numbers really fit in um, in the environment. Um, so we're talking about performance and it's like these SSDs, they cost money dollar per gig. So what's the point? So we talk about DD compression clearly. Um, here you can see, um, so Permabit came up with these numbers um, and it's it's just a chart showing what they expect for data growth going out to 2020. Um, so of this data, you can see how much is duplicated. 75% they predict is duplicate data. Now, obviously that's the difference of 44 zettabytes versus 10 zettabytes. So a huge note there, if you could dedupe the whole world, what kind of scale would you look at? Um, and now, of course, you know, there's some Seagate uh, CEO that kind of turned over in his chair or whatnot. But, um, you know, this, these are real factors and these are things that we need to kind of slow down and mitigate. Um, and then in your environment, at least you can optimize this to A, get performance for all your space, because now you're not buying 44 zettabytes or say it's 40 terabytes worth of SSD space, but 10 terabytes worth of SSD space to kind of put that in perspective. Um, so what do we do? Um, so inline deduplication and compression. This is very, very important that it's done in this regard as well. So one thing cute about the way we're doing things, we do dedupe inline and compress it. There's nothing done after the fact. We're not wasting any time or any space by writing this data down to disk and then recalculating anything down the road because we're quote unquote falling behind or anything like that. What, what's the problem with that? Well, now you're writing to these disks which have limited endurance times well that's a huge issue even worse the first time that you write it say you're not dedupe and compressing the data up front you're actually going to full-on write that block all the way down to disk then you're going to try to rehydrate your load so uh, a huge note there uh, the other factor about doing compression afterwards say it's a duplicate block so an uh, a, a non-unique block basically um, we're not compressing checking to see if there's a duplicate. That's a waste of a cycle. We'll check to see if it's a duplicate first. If it is, we're not going to waste the CPU and memory cycles. On compressing that. Point 
Giving is much possible. We're on. All right. Get a backup, backup cable here. I think that's right. Okay, let me share my screen. Hey, hopefully everyone, this is Tyler again. Um, sorry you had to see my and James ugly faces right there for a moment. Um, hope that doesn't give you nightmares. Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, YouTube will um, every now and then and um, if you guys are still having a little bit of issues with me when I'm saying this, and I'm I'll post.
How long do you know when it cut off? Um, no. It means Google and Google. No, it, the Chrome shouldn't be an issue. It hasn't <laughs> been before. Testing, testing. Testing the mic. All right, mic looks like it's pretty good. Uh, it looks like we are screen sharing. We're gonna try presenting to everybody. Again, really, really sorry. Um, seems like whenever I forget to make the announcement that YouTube uh, never acts up, but when I do forget, or when I do remember, it uh, usually does remember to cause us problems. Uh, um, let's hopefully this will work. Yeah, we're not gonna jinx that again. Uh, <laughs> that's the last time we're giving that uh, warning out there. Um, so basically, um, I don't know how far in uh, it cut off, but database environments with workflow, just basically workflow is multiple copies of the database. If you're doing it from reporting servers or if the application inherently does it itself. Um, with that, you know, you can see the exchange and well, there's a real factor here. Uh, what happens is compression's automatically turned on by default. There's a little check box as you're kind of setting it up. And it, it has that checkbox just automatically set. So what happens is with dedupe and compression, it's just harder to see deduped blocks or duplicates inside of um, compressed blocks, which are compressed by exchange. Nice little story here. So say you have a 10 terabyte database. Um, this is an actual customer. So they um, used exchange and they had about six terabytes is what was usable. So then what we had was three terabytes once we put it on uh, the store trends 3600 array. Well, six to three, now we're looking at a two to one ratio. That's not nine to one, <laughs> period. So, and this is where, you know, dedupe just kind of, it's it's a little finicky or not finicky in the, in the aspect of how it does or what it does, but it's more of when you actually get that ratio out of there. So in this case, we were like, why would this be two to one? Well, of course, if you don't compress that database, which we decompressed it, then we put it on our box. That actually went from, uh, so originally it was 10 terabytes down to six for compressed, then down to three on our store trends unit. So that was a two to one ratio for us. Uh, overall, you're looking at a three to one ratio from the nine or 10 terabytes down to three. Now we decompressed all that stuff and then put it just directly on our store trends unit. Well, that went down to one terabyte. So now you are looking at a nine to one by letting us do what we do. So there may be a little bit of a shift in the way that things happen and the way you do actually, um, you know, work on data and stuff like that and letting applications do this. They're not doing it as efficiently as they should, or if they had deduplication in there, maybe it would be a better ratio than the, the six terabytes there. So huge notes when it comes to the way things are set up and then user directory. So just the concept, the simple concept here is I, like I was just saying, it's hard to dedupe compressed data. Simple as that. Well, in general, most everybody's user directories, this is all docx, xlsx, pptx, which I have a PowerPoint right here, um, and all that stuff. So what's happening, Microsoft Office is compressing this data. That's what the x is. Um, so in that, you're looking at about a two to one ratio. Does that sound familiar to the compressed exchange environment? Absolutely. So this is how all this stuff plays in. And if you don't want to compress your stuff or say you have a heavy user directory environment and a two to one ratio just doesn't fit the bill for what you need, that's where hybrids come in. That's where we fit in with this regard. So in that regard, so you can actually see how this actually works. Um, so if we go here, um, so how does this apply to everybody? Uh, how does this apply into you know, SSDs and so say you have VDI, I'm sure everybody in, in general knows what VDI is or the concept just behind virtualization. You're taking these shared resources and shipping them out basically to, instead of VMs and servers, actual desktop users. Well, with that, of course you have store trends at the bottom of there. Um, so with the hybrid solution, what does this look like? So you can see here um, with hybrids, we have to pin volumes into specific situations to say, hey, this is a high performance volume. This is where we need here. And anything that's in that tier zero, that is getting sub one millisecond latency all day, every day. The problem is the misses and stuff like that, which we mitigate and handle that uh, as fast as possible. But this is where this fits in. And even better, if you have the money to put all your you know, high performance space in there, fine. 
Now, one thing that StoreTrends does is actually some of the replica volumes or some of the Temp OS that's just untouched at all, that will actually take those blocks individually from our quality of service. We can say how long we want to say that, hey, yeah, this thing is a stale block. It's not accessed at all. Then we'll actually demote it down and clear up space in the SSD. So there's a huge advantage there. And you can see I have the tier zero split in half right here. So I have a bright red or a lighter red and a dark red. Well, because we do tiering and caching in the SSDs to kind of get that, that high performance, they're all, all get that into the tier. And then say you do have that Rio that was de uh, demoted down to spinning drives or just sitting on spinning drives. You can actually cache that IO and it'll get instantaneous SSD performance. Then we can monitor it and say, hey, is this a high performance block all of a sudden? If it is, it goes into the tier. If not, we'll just flush it back down to disk as it'll just continue to get read from or what have you. Um, so now this volume pinning situation, this is how we can say, okay, you know, these things get certain space and we don't waste, you know, so replicas are where the desktops come off of. Golden images, there's no heavy IO that goes to those. So we can just simply say, hey, that goes to spinning drives and that's it. Now, of course, with all flash, huge advantage though, everything gets SSD performance. End of story. Now, if we go into databases and we can talk about how much, you know, the SSD tier just, it always does not get accessed, um, uh, or I'm sorry, all of the database does not get accessed um, at all times. So we can talk about that, but you can kind of see the different layers there. And then when we go into this, we pin volumes into certain situations. Um, and in this case, databases, logs, what have you, and you can pick and choose what you pin where. And then we basically say, okay, the older parts of the databases, those will actually get flushed down to the lower tiers or demoted down over time. Um, with all flash, now you don't have to worry about, okay, you know, the snapshot, you know, I was mounting this test database because I want to just kind of see how it worked in this setting or that setting or just to see, you know, validate it. You don't have to worry about a performance of an older snapshot or something like that um, when you mount that database on the side. So huge notes when it comes to that stuff. Um, and then if we look at backups and DR, so of course, store trends, um, before the performance stuff, January 2014 came out with all the hybrid and, and flash, we were actually really focused on just storing centralized data, coming out with solutions that could replicate to each other. And we don't require duplicate units either. So you can replicate, even in this case, an all flash array to a 3500 hybrid array or to an all spinning disk array. If you just want to keep the data safe, you can do that. No big deal at all. And inside of that, we have wide we have wide area data services. So we are optimizing that link, not with TCP window optimization, but actual AM um, UD so compressing and deduping it. Now, what happens? So in this case, it's an active site and a, and a passive site. But what happens if it's active active? What do you have to do? Well, we don't want our our active data from the other site, which is passive on this inside of SSDs so we can pin the DR space, all those snapshots down to the lower tiers while keeping the actual performance stuff for that primary site up in the SSDs and not waste any of that space. Now, say this actually does turn into a primary site, it is a little slow to make sure that the DR space starts tearing up and stuff like that because you do want, if this is an active site, all of a sudden for the DR space as well, well, you need to have performance for that. Well, we can as well increase it, but it still takes time to do all these. Now, obviously, if we have an all flash, it immediately has SSD performance. Everything's sitting on SSD. So uh, there is a huge advantage there so long as DRs are coming in. or I'm sorry, um, blocks are coming in. So now one thing to note, though, with the DR space and, and using in that regard, we absolutely keep this very efficient um, uh, on an all flash environment. And you do get a higher dedupe rate because of the changes and stuff like that. Um, so how do we know all this stuff? You know, um, we're kind of bumping on time because of the, um, the delays that we've had and stuff like that. But we have this iData tool. It gives you everything, CPU, memory, and all that. It's absolutely agentless when it comes to the remote servers that it's monitoring. You install it to one server centralized. And what it'll do is just, it'll take your point to exchange, your SQL, or if you have a vCenter server, you can really just point it to the vCenter server and it'll auto-populate all your hosts for you. Um, and then one thing that can actually using it for profiling for the individual desktops. Um, so you can kind of do those kind of things. 
And one thing that we came up with were dedupe expectations. So with dedupe expectations, we can actually say, okay, you know, run this. This is not, uh, it's a different installable just because, and you can see that actually right here, store trends dedupe analyzer tool. Um, just because it does need to take offline data. It is doing a bunch of reads and writes to analyze and say, okay, here's your dedupe ratio. Um, this is how we get ahead of the curve and we cut the guessing game out. Uh, the iData tool tells us your hot data. The dedupe analyzer tool tells us, okay, well, what do we expect for dedupe in that regard? So a very nice uh, set of tools here to really say, hey, you know, these guys are not going to underscope us, first of all. We're not going to send you out half of the environment that you need and then say, oh, you need to upgrade six months from now. And then B, we're not just going to send anything out to you. If a 3600 doesn't make sense because your, your dedupe analyzer just doesn't, it's just not dedupable, your data, well, we can basically say, okay, you know what, a, a hybrid array is probably your best bet if you need that performance and stuff like that. Um, so of the hot data, you can kind of see examples of a bunch of different customers. And the best part about this, so the cold data is the gray, untouched for over a week, okay? And you can see in most cases, this is 60% of the environment. Um, the one case that's outside of that, well, we, we know what it is, but you can see in this case, even 30%, say it's 40 terabytes, that's a big factor of space that you're just not even touching. And then even better, the yellow 100 plus accesses. So this is really where the SSDs come in is in that yellow piece and then rotating that data in and out for, you know, the latest hour worth of data. And what is the, you know, the hottest data? Um, so in this case, A, all flash, you know, you never know if this yellow data is coming from the 60% mark or something, just some random data in that, in that regard. So it needs to have that SSD space immediately uh, or something like that. Um, or if it's just everything within the last hour is really kind of accessed now, but it was previously a yellow block. So um, in that case, and, it, and we take that case by case um, regarding, you know, what, you know, what kind of data expectations do we have and stuff like that. If it's a very normal, in this case, infrastructure view, um, you can get a lot of sporadic um, accesses. And with that, you can actually have an easy argument for um, an all flash array, especially if, you know, you have a good DD ratio. Um, so now if we look at this in a database environment, so this is only using store transfer databases, and we also ran iData to kind of compare the two, but you can see here it's a lot leaner. Look at the yellow space there. I mean, it's 1% basically. We'll say 2% to cover everything. So you can get real efficient when it comes to um, actual I.O. blocks, so which blocks are actually getting heavily accessed. In that case, I mean, we can say easily 10% of your environment get SSDs for it, the rest of it, I mean, you, don't, you just don't need all flash for that. So two different arguments, they absolutely fit with all, all flash and hybrid uh, in that regard. And you can actually see here, let's overlay the two um, just to kind of get, okay, well, what's, you know, what do the averages look like? So, you know, if you have a 40 terabyte environment, you know, what are you gonna do Buy three terabytes worth of SSD space? Um, you can, you know, and it will handle this and all that stuff, but you just never know what the factors are now. And this is about 8%. You can see here kind of where the, the bright red fits in there. Now, you know, if you bought that, I mean, it's, it's good and it'll absolutely handle that. And if we go a step further and say, Hey, you know what, everything in the last day, I want that kind of in SSD space. Well, that'd be 12 terabytes if you look at this percentage here. So, um, you know, with dedupe and say everything's good in that regard, you divide these by four or seven, you're looking at, you know, 900 gigs worth of SSD space that we really need to handle rights. Uh, and that's in the worst case scenario. And that's just to make sure that we're kind of handling what's going on in the environment as it changes and grows. Um, so how do we do this stuff? Um, so we have two solutions, obviously the hybrid, we're using caching and tiering to kind of say, hey, you know, um, the immediate IO goes into cache and then we can kind of promote it into tier if it is valid tier data. Now with the latest stuff with our 3600, we're just simply watching the data that comes in, if it's read data or write data, and we're saying, hey, if this is always read from and there's no writes, we're not worried about endurance. Well, why are we gonna write this stuff to enterprise MLC drives? You can read from these uh, consumer grades all day, every day for 400 years if you want to. Um, I think it's 2000 years is the lifetime of the actual, um, just the SSD cell. Um, so you can actually say, okay, you know what? We won't waste all enterprise drives on this. And this is what can cut a lot of costs down. The, the factor between the costs is a huge note. Um, and you can see the right data here. 
well, okay, if we see rights coming in, we'll actually absolutely put that in the right tier and take care of it. Now, what happens if that read tier gets written to? Well, that's where our in-lift cash mechanism comes in and we'll cash that IO into the right tier. So now we're, we're making sure the rights go into the right, uh, the enterprise class drives. And then if we continually see it written to, it'll basically get promoted into the right tier. Even better, it's just a metadata update. So you don't even have to worry about the, okay, well, what if I have a bunch of data and you're rewriting and stuff? No, it's just a metadata update into the right tier. It's already on those disk, disk drives anyways. Um, and then if it continually gets read from because it was naturally read from and it was just simply an update, well, then we'll just flush it basically down to the tier. So we're maximizing endurance, the lifespan of all these SSDs dramatically. Um, of course, with support, you know, um, say you just overwrite these things or what have you, all these drives are absolutely covered on support anyhow. Um, we do have the standard support terms, one to five years, 24 by seven phone support, all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of see, you know, where everything kind of fits in. Um, and we do have remote email alert monitoring so we can see what, you know, what the medium errors are on the hard drives for a hybrid array or what the endurance is on the SSDs for all the SSDs. Um, and we do proactively dr uh, replace drives. So, you know, if we do see the endurance getting low or the medium error is getting high, we'll actually go ahead and send you out a drive ahead of time. You can replace it then in the evening or whatnot. Um, and you can actually see the four hour supports also available. Um, here's all of our models. Um, you can see the 3400. So we've actually been doing spinning drives and then going into the hybrid, which is the 3500i, and then the all flashes, the 3600, 3610. And the only difference between the 3600 and 3610 is really just the terabytes that it supports capacity wise. And we just wanted to have a low cost, as low as possible um, capacity unit to just make sure that this can be affordable for everybody, uh, even in the lowest, lightest budgets. Uh, you can kind of see the compression of DDoop, of course, ESX6 support, iData enhancements, of course, we brought out the DDoop tool, and everything's expandable. So you can grow up to those levels uh, in that regard. Um, so now a lot of you guys are like, well, <laughs> Store Trends, that's great. Uh, I still don't know who you are. Well, we actually did a thing with Storage Review to compare us against EQ, HP, NetApp, XIO, Dot Hill, whoever. Um, to really shine, um, shine our performance and actually show, okay, well, how does this actually step in there? Um, absolutely unbiased, unpaid for. You guys go to that website, check it out. Um, Tanasia Group, this was paid, but they came on site and they just validated what we're saying is, um, is our, 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 our performance metrics, um, IOPS, throughput, and all that kind of stuff, and then even some exchange tests and stuff like that. Um, and then SSG now for the guys that are looking at I data and saying, hey, um, I want to make sure this thing's secure and stuff like that. They absolutely went through, tried to break into the encrypted file. They couldn't. We gave them the key once they did break in um, with the key, basically, I don't know if it's breaking in and uh, entering at that point. Uh, but once they did get in, they did only see performance metrics. So, um, so that's kind of nice there. Um, here you can see just how we actually stack up against these guys. The latest is the highlighted, the dot hill. Um, you can see, you know, we're well over them on transactions per second. Um, and then even better, the latency, though. This is the average response time for all this I.O. Under full load, we were 41 milliseconds to where everybody else, nobody else has broken the 100 millisecond barrier yet um, other than us. Uh, and you can see here, you know, these guys did beat us by 0.2 in a grade for that. That's the XIO right here for SSDs. And we did, I contend, we had them. We got to rematch uh, we'd absolutely exceed in that regard as well so um just kind of to show you you know really where the stuff matches up and you can read more on storagereview.com um a bunch of customers different verticals uh, different types of workloads um you know and then the best part about this is um the largest customers in here um for store trends they didn't want to um, get them out so it's 95 percent of these customers are actual customers from last year that actually purchased a unit last year and then even better, 75% of these guys are actual repeat customers. So, you know, not only do we stand behind it, but we absolutely have the technology and we can absolutely fit in in all these scenarios. Um, and here's just a couple examples for you guys to kind of see. Um, you know, Iconotes, they wanted the snappy storage. Uh, Aquatech, they're doing um, pipeline manufacturing solutions. Um, you can kind of see the different scenarios. You know, they have a little bit of VDI, a little bit of um, centralized data storage. Uh, UT Dallas, you know, education, um, looking at, you know, high databases 
um, and stuff like that. And, you know, they're doing consolidation. Some people are upgrading. Um, and then we have repeat customer on the bottom left, also doing bi-directional replication from two sites. Um, and they do, they have very different workloads at each site, but they are DRing from the other site. So just kind of nice solutions there um, and stuff like that. And of course, all of our customers are referenceable and all that stuff. So you guys can kind of, um, you know, if you, if you need that validation or whatnot, um, it, it is there. All right, James. Um, thanks so much. And um, thanks, everybody, for uh, sticking with us um, through some of those technical difficulties. Um, those of you that are still here, you are the uh, the road warriors, and we greatly appreciate you. Um, wanted to make a quick note. I know we're cutting into the question and answer time a little bit, um, but we'll be sending out a link for a, a, uh, a full length um, demo that we're going to do not demo, just a full presentation um, that hopefully um, will not have any interruptions in it. Um, that way, once we send that link out to you guys, um, the part that you missed today, we can go back. Um, you can go back and check it out, um, see anything that you may have missed. Um, and, um, and again, we great, do greatly apologize. It is unfortunate that it happened today. Um, YouTube does not, does not always cooperate with us, but um, uh, again, we do appreciate your, um, your consideration. You sticking with us this long. Um, so with that, James, did you have anything demo-wise um, that you um, wanted to go into real quick before? Uh, we questions, and then I'm just kind of clicking around because we did lose a little bit of time, so you guys can kind of see. And obviously, if you have, if you want to see a demo that kind of pertains to you guys, DR-wise or performance-wise or whatnot, you know, just reach out to us, and um, you know, it's no big deal at all. I, I always have a demo available, so. Very cool. Let me just make a quick note before we do this. Um, uh, at the bottom of your screen, in the description of the video, you should see a few links. You might have to click on the little more tab, but please feel free to go on there. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn. I'm always looking to grow on LinkedIn. Um, we have the iData uh, link on there as well that James was talking about beforehand, um, the analysis tool for your network. And if you'd like to a no obligation quote um, estimate for any project you might be working on, there's a price code generator link on there as well. So you can fill out a little information, how much capacity you're looking for, how much performance you're looking for, and we'll email you a, a comparable configuration estimate um, for your project. And that's obviously no obligation at all. Um, real quick, I'm just going to kind of pick off top of these since we are um, running out of time pretty quickly here. Um, does this, uh, James, I guess I'll kind of direct these at you. Um, how does your product integrate with Veeam and VMware? And I guess they mean um, both of those together using them in conjunction. Yeah, I mean, we've absolutely done uh, validation with Veeam, uh, done the full certification suites. Um, and then, of course, VMware is a requirement at this point as they have like 95% market share. Um, and then you can see the ESX 6.0 supports there and all that stuff. So we have been absolutely growing with them and, um, and all that stuff. We've been with VMware since three, uh, ESX 3.5 was the first um, actual validation testing and all that stuff. So uh, been, been a lot of uh, integration with them and all that kind of stuff. Very good, very good. And we'll just do a couple more here. Um, uh, uh, so we kind of, he, so the question is, do you offer tiering and is it expandable? Um, and uh, can low cost spindle disks be used along with it? We've kind of already touched on the tiering aspect of it, um, but can you just um, comment really quickly on the expandability and um, how it relates into um, spinning disks as well? Yeah, absolutely. So expandability, we actually have a storage uh, wizard down here on the bottom left um, that'll really load in if I had an empty um, expansion shelf in here. And uh, what that would do is basically say, okay, you know, you have these types of drives and then here's, you know, what you expand with. Uh, it's the exact same uh, case with the 3500i, uh, just having a wizard, just you plug in the JBOD, and then basically it'll expand out the capacity um, in various ways too. So you can either add the capacity to the storage pool, which will basically stripe out the space for the volumes that are active in there. And we do a restriping. Uh, we have a con uh, CSM, which is the striping mechanism um, for basically making sure that that IO load then actually will spread out across the disks and get further um, IO wise. Um, and then you can also have up to eight different storage pools. So if you did, say you're an MSP and you had a different kind of customer or you just want to keep their IO just completely separate, you can also just create a whole new storage pool and keep everything completely separate. So multiple options in that regard. All right, and we'll just do two quick more questions. Um, uh, looking at flash storage longevity compared to um, hard disk drives, um, how does flash storage compare with, I guess, the, the length and the endurance that it can last? Um, I guess standard spinning disk is somewhere around the, you know, expect around the five-year mark. So where does flash relate into that? Yeah, and so just because of technology changes, we kind of focus on five years. But the beautiful thing about um, at least SSDs 
um, the enterprise in particular, you can actually see, you know, 87 petabytes worth of rights over five years, um, what that kind of comes into 10 or 15 times rights a day, uh, just depending on the SSD drive um, throughout that, um, that disk drive. So with that, you know, it just depends on the individual customer, some heavier right customers and stuff like that. You know, the SSDs won't last as long, but you're sure as heck not writing 87 petabytes worth of data. Um, so you can actually see, you know, how that'll last uh, longevity wise. And the disk cells can actually last up to 2000 years um, is kind of the spec there. So obviously we haven't lived through um, actually <laughs> surviving that, but say it's 50 years, um, you know, as long as you don't have enough rights that are that'll wear it out or anything like that, you'll be perfectly fine to last uh, for a very, very long time with SSDs. Very good. And I know we have um, a few more questions here. Um, however, what I think would be better is um, since we've already kind of um, uh, we're kind of coming up on the hour here and we've already lost a little bit of time due to the technical difficulties. What I think would be better is um, we know who asked the question. So we'll send out um, we'll send out some email responses um, to these questions that we have here this afternoon. Uh, we've got some great questions here left still on um, comparing the um, storage engine unit to other vendors, um, how to reduce, you know, your, your guest VM's latency, um, some other things there. But, um, you know, we do really appreciate everyone taking the time to speak with us um, and present, let us present to them this afternoon. Uh, James, did you have anything else for everyone before we signed off? No, just, um, you know, any questions you guys have, feel free to reach out. We're always available for any questions, um, comparing us to other competitors, talking about technology. I love talking about technology. Obviously I, we don't even skim the surface of what I could just yap about forever and ever. So um, feel free to reach out. It's no big deal at all. We're always open. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, James. Um, everyone, I, again, um, real quick, uh, at the bottom of the description, you can check out, uh, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any additional questions from the event, um, any comments or concerns or feedback. Um, I know what uh, probably everyone's number one feedback is going to be at this point. Um, however, um, anything, uh, any questions you guys have is um, more than welcome. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, feel free to hit us up on those. We send out funny tweets from time to time um, and do giveaways and that sort of stuff. And, um, and yeah, feel free to fill out the price code generator or download iData. Both are free um, and both can be really helpful for you guys. Um, other than that, this is Tyler Newberry um, with the Store Trends team at AMI. We're signing off and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.